Welcome to Thriver Talks with Stephanie and Nally. I'm Nally. And I'm Stephanie. And today is episode 25 about acupuncture and Chinese medicine with Dr. Lo. We have the absolute pleasure to interview our personal acupuncturist. Um, not only is an acupuncturist, Dr. Lo is a hematologist, medical oncologist, and board certified medical acupuncturist. So it's such an honor to have Dr. Lo with us today, and we're excited to learn about Chinese medicine and acupuncture. So without further ado, here is episode 25. Hello, Dr. Lo. Hello, how are you, Nellie and (laughs) Stephanie? How are you? We are great. How are you? Very good surviving in this crisis. Hope everybody's well and healthy. Yes. Yes. We're all staying home. Where are you right now? I'm in Hoboken, my office. In Hoboken, I, New Jersey. Yeah, Hoboken, New Jersey. And my office has been closed since March 15 till now. So it's a full month. So I'm kind of uh, bored. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we'll give you something to do. And we're so honored that we get to share you with our community of thrivers. Um, just to give like a little background information. Um, I met Dr. Lowe through a foundation Um, It's a wonderful foundation in New York called Five Under 40, and they provide services uh, to women under 40 years old going through breast cancer. And I was introduced to Dr. Lowe and had a series of acupuncture visits with him. And I immediately was like wowed by not only the acupuncture, but you and your knowledge. And when Nally came to town, Jen Finkelstein, who's the founder of Five Under Forty, also treated Nally to a session with you, Dr. Lowe, and we were both just like blown away by you. So it's such an honor to have you to share with our community today. Yeah, I learned so much from that first session with you. That was my first acupuncture session overall. And that was when my journey to acupuncture, because a lot of my followers know that I now do acupuncture regularly. And it was all thanks to Dr. Lowe, because when I had my first session with him, my I was neutropenic, my white blood cells were very low. And I did a blood test a couple of weeks after having a session with Dr. Lowe and Lowe and behold, my neutrophil levels were higher than they ever been before. And I remember specifically, you told me that this was to boost my immune system. This was to increase my white blood cells. So it's really an honor to have you on our podcast to discuss how that happened exactly. <laughs> so just to give our audience a little background about you, um, like I mentioned in the intro, you were an are a hematologist hematologist, medical oncologist prior to just doing traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture. So could you tell us a little bit about that? All right. Thank you very much for that kind introduction about me. And uh, oh. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to share with you and everybody else about uh, health issues in general. Mm-hmm. And actually my transition from Western medicine to chi- Chinese medicine is not really surprising. Why I say this is because after I stopped my private practice in medical oncology in Hoboken, New Jersey, the area New Jersey, soon I discover there's some problem or limitation in Western oncology in dealing with cancer patients. To be specific, I remember that was my second year of practice, private practice. I had a lady who was in her late 40s, has a, br- a lung cancer and metastasis as the brain, and she experienced severe pain, severe pain, for which I've treated her with morphine, subcutaneous, intravenous, IV drip, IV continuous drip and whatnot, and plus at that time, we have long, long-standing morphine pills, which last 12 hours, and on top of that, I added uh, the patches, uh, morphine patches, but nothing could stop her pain. And I was so frustrated. So I thought, okay, since Western medicine couldn't stop her, so let me see if there's anything else I can do. So I went back to what I've studied in Taiwan, the acupuncture. And that's what I picked up the acupuncture from that point on. And as it went by, people were still not interested in acupuncture in the 80s. Tonight, he started to have a little more interest, and gradually, 
things roll, keep rolling on, there are more awareness and interest in acupuncture. So I have more patience, more and more, and then gradually I finally transit, uh, tra trans transform my practice from Western medicine into China medicine. And during the course of that transition, not only because of acupuncture itself, it's also because through my practice in oncology, I've seen a lot of patients, all kinds of cancer. I treat a general oncologist. And I learned a lot about life itself. And also realize it's not only Chinese medicine can fill in the gap that Western medicine cannot fill in. Also by doing, approaching the, the problem with in combination with Chinese medicine, that led me to explore another level of human life, human health is spirituality. So as a matter of fact, I'm not really sure that acupuncture Chinese medicine is enough to combine Western medicine to Western medicine to explain human life, human health. One has to add spirituality into this complex problem. We agree. It's exactly what our book is going to be out be about. We cover the mind, the body, and the spirit and the soul. And that's why you were the perfect person to interview because you, we believe you really cover all aspects. I'm curious to know where did you learn your teachings? Okay, I studied acupuncture in Taiwan when I was in attending medical school. Mm -hmm. Then I came to this country. I did my internal medicine, hematology, oncology. I did my medical oncology fellowship in Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. After that, I started practice. And it was the, t the patients I treated, they taught me a lot. They taught me something that Western medicine did not teach me. So what were, like, what are some of the things that you learned from the patients? Um, just that... Be, that it was more of a spiritual or emotional, like in terms of just say like cancer patients, um, were you able to identify that it was something deeper than just cancer that was causing the actual oh, yes. disease? Very interesting. Of course, I'd like to share it with you my experience among all those patients I've treated. And of course, in Chinese medicine, we have the main difference between Chinese medicine and Western medicine is Western medicine does not include emotion as part of the factor of the war of the illnesses. Whereas, whereas Chinese medicine emphasizes a lot that emotion can cause each individual organ and become a disease ill. And this is a theory from Chinese, Chinese medical book. However, in my clinical practice, practice in oncology, I've seen quite a few. For example, I had, A patient uh, who was a uh, colon cancer mm -hmm. in his 50s and unfortunately his condition was very advanced well, which has already metastasized to liver and he re initially responded to chemotherapy and soon then he, the cancer is just beyond repair now so he passed six months after that his father had lung cancer and as you all know, smokers cause lung, smoking cause lung cancer, but that mostly are small cell. Non-small cell are not really related to smoking. And this person is smoking, as I had quit smoking for about 40 years prior to that. So one cannot contribute. The formation of his cancer was caused by smoking. Yeah. However, the link can be supported by Chinese medical theory which is organ has emotion in Chinese medicine. And the organ, the lung organ, the emotion represent, uh, represent lung is the grief. And apparently this patient, this father in his 80s, grieved so much of his son. Six months after his son passed away, she, uh, he developed lung cancer. Mm. Of course, one can always argue, oh, my baby coincidental. I'm sorry, I do, did not agree. There's no such thing in the world as coincidental. There's cause and effect. And especially, they're supported by 
we, I call, we call five element theory in Chinese medicine. Each organ has emotion. And also, for example, I, I have another lady. She's alive and well. I saw her about five years ago. She had lung cancer two times. One time was, I don't know, someone in her family, her brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. So I asked her, why are you very, were you so sad? Very, very sad about his passing? She said, yes, because he brought me up because I lost my father very young. He brought me up as a father. And a few months after the bro brother-in-law passed, she got lung cancer. Wow. And luckily she recovered. But that's only two cases. I have so many others. And for example, you have uh, breast cancer, mm -hmm. kidney cancer, stomach cancer, and so on and so forth. So all these, my clinical experiences taught me a lot. And that made me look into Chinese medicine more, more diligently, try to find a systemic, well, profound discussion about emotion and human health. So how would you say that system works for those who are not familiar with traditional Chinese medicine and especially acupuncture um, in particular, since we come to you for acupuncture, um, how would you describe how acupuncture and the system works? Okay, how acupuncture works is that, first of all, I, let me give you some background about uh, what acupuncture is all about. Yes. Acupuncture is based on the theory of meridian theory human body is run by 14 meridians that run up and down the body. And each meridian has corresponding organ that's involved. So the theory goes, all these meridians, just like rivers in, in the body, human body, they communicate one to another and they have all connection one to another. This complex interaction among all these meridians. In other words, all, this, all our organs are interacting. They are not independent. So the theory goes that if there's any pathway that is blocked, and illness will arise. So what acupuncture does is to unblock the blockage. Mm -hmm. So to ensure that the flow can be smooth and the normal function can be restored. That's how acupuncture works. So when you, like for instance, when we get acupuncture, some people watching and listening have never even had acupuncture. So when you insert these tiny needles into the points um, on the body. So when you insert the needle, it's causing energy to go to the needle? Or can you explain like how the points unblock the, um, make the meridians flow or unblock maybe clogged energy? Yes, exactly. You're what you say is exactly what, how, how it happens. Because when needle goes in, you start to re-regulate re the energy flow of that meridian. So when, just give me one analogy. The one analogy I like to put is that, very simple. So that's like in Manhattan, or, or First Street to 140th Street, and then or First Avenue to 12th Avenue, or Great, great, great right? Mm -hmm. And if some, let's say President of the United States visit the UN, they block 40th Street and then 2nd Avenue. That caused that whole Manhattan Island paralyzed. Yes. Mm -hmm. so Understand now? Traffic jam everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you jam one spot, gradually it will spread to all over the place. And Such that's how yeah, that's how acupuncture way. works. Mm -hmm. So we, we unblock that little point. Then the try to flow will go back to more normal. Just like energy flow will return to normal. So it's a good way to describe it, isn't it? Amazing. That's yes. a great way to describe it. So for in my case in particular where you helped my white blood cells go up after just one treatment with you. Um, what exactly was happening there? What did you do to my body? Very, okay, interesting. Actually, I have studied, I have done, not studied, I've done my own research, mm -hmm. combining what's in the East. And fortunately, I, I'm Chinese, I read Chinese, I speak Chinese. So I have the opportunity to review all the ancient and current literatures from China. And the research of acupuncture is very much lacking outside of China compared to what we see in China. And I went, went to the literature in Chinese language. I found very important message or research I've done in China. Few particular points has really shown the effect in boosting human 
in our immune system. To be specific, they combine the Western methodology and Chinese medical acupuncture practice. They have demonstrated a certain point can increase white blood cell. Certain point can increase immunoglobin, IgG, IgA, IgM, etc., and so on and so forth in carbon complements. All these are fine detailed study from China that has been done. And not only that, in the ancient literature, especially that well, another piece of information that I've gathered was there was one Japanese doctor it was about 300 years ago. Of course, Japan has adopted Chinese acupuncture or Chinese medicine over centuries. So they are very, very much into Chinese, uh, Chinese medicine as well. And this particular doctor, he had already 300 years ago advocated to apply certain point to stay healthy. So he even put into a national, nationalized movement from grassroots that everybody does it in that particular point. So all this information, ancient and current, that made me uh, come up with my own combination to improve white blood cell. Another one of the cases that I've, I've done about white count, white blood cell count, is this. I don't know if I had told you before. This was a gentleman who had lymph Hodgkin lymphoma. That was about 15 years ago I treated. And he had the first course of chemotherapy in Hackensack Medical Center in New Jersey. And of course, blood count goes down as well expected. But then, so they give him Neupogen to boost the white blood cell. Unfortunately, he, is a, he was allergic to Neupogen. Mm. So he was stuck. They couldn't give him chemotherapy. His white count was too low. Somehow, his friend, who was my patient before, recommended him to come to me. So I did that. I did out by my combination to, uh, to the person. And I helped him through six courses of chemotherapy without Nipogen. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I consider that was really very successful. And he's still alive and well. Wow. Yes. That's incredible. I yes. think one thing that, you know, I mean, there's so much great information you're sharing with us. But one thing I always think of is that Chinese medicine has been around for centuries, centuries. or like thousands of years. Um, and now, like you said, in the 80s, no one was really recognizing it in the 90s a little bit. And today, I feel like um, it's more accepted or it's yeah. more known people, you know, are, are implementing it into their daily routines. But um, this practice, it, even I was going to say, Natalie and I, when we went to the Miami Breast Cancer Conference last year, I believe they were speaking about acupuncture also, um, you know, acknowledging the many benefits of it. So um, you know, you've known this, this knowledge has been around for centuries and now it's being integrated into modern medicine. Um, so I guess like for our listeners or viewers, like what are some things that people should consider when looking for an acupuncturist or? Okay. Very good question. Very practical as well. Actually, I've heard that the Sloan Catherine House, the Memorial Hospital yes. in New York City has combine acupuncture treatment. In yes, I actually, oh, that's great. when that I was, was going to Sloan, 15 I years got ago. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, my patient told me, I've never been there for that. And my patient told me that um, they are treated by acupuncturists, not MD. And actually, I, from what I understand is that um, they use acupuncturists to treat those related side effects, for example, mm -hmm. nausea, vomiting, that's about it. I don't know exact any more further detail. Mm -hmm. uh, however, back to your question, how can one choose what, what one should be looking for when you use acupuncture? Yes, very important. Uh, unfortunately, not too many acupuncturists like me who knows oncology. <laughs> true. <laughs> You're one of a kind, Dr. That is Lowe. So true. Of course, you can always <laughs> say that, that my, I, I've seen a lot of acupuncturists, they boast that they had treated cancer patients. I understand they do. Every day I can treat acupuncture, I can treat cancer patients. However, one thing I like to point out to everybody is cancer patients are the same like anybody who doesn't have cancer because they are the same body structure. Mm -hmm. But one has to understand when treating a person who has cancer, several precautions has to be 
taken into consideration. That's very important. Um, if the person who, the acupuncturist who does not have the good understanding about human health, or especially cancer background, and it is possible that risk can arise. For example, um, as you all know, or all of us know, chemotherapy and now is immunotherapy. They both are very, very powerful in, in creating side effects for the person mm -hmm. who receive it. Mm -hmm. Blood count goes down, white blood cell count goes down, then you're gonna have infection. Play the count goes down, you're gonna bleed. And some other uh, side effects, complication can arise from different chemotherapy agents or immunotherapy agents, and also radiation therapy. And all these are very complex picture. I have been there for past 30 years, so I know very well what to look for. However, for those who don't treat cancer patients as an oncologist, they don't need re fragments of it. So they may have to be very careful in treating any patient they treat. That's what I have to tell, kind of advise all those acupuncturists who are treating cancer patients, please, please be very careful. Don't be so, too heroic. So just to piggyback on that question, so is there a difference between one being just uh, like a certified acupuncturist and, and then in comparison to a medical oncologist, is there, is there a difference? Uh, yes, of course. A difference is understanding in seeing a depth of the problem. Give, mm -hmm. I'll give you one example. For example, if a person comes with pain in the shoulder, go to the acupuncturist or go to a medical oncologist. Acupuncturist has start treating with the pain only. However, in my, in my brain, in my experience, I say, what is this? Is it tendinitis, this fracture bones, or this uh, neuropathy, or is there any problem? Mm -hmm. Why I say this is not really so much um, exaggerating from the reality. I have cases like that. For example, that was one patient, um, a lady. She, as a matter of fact, she had metastatic ovarian, ovarian cancer. She came to me with lower back pain in the right buttock area. Make a long story short, she said she went to an uh, acupuncturist and uh, who refer actual acupuncturist didn't dare touch her, send her to me, which was good, of course. And this, the exact situation is this. She had pain in the right, right buttock. And normally, if without any consideration, knowing what's going on, acupuncturist stuck, uh, will put a needle into the area, which is the step one in acupuncture management. They frequently, not all the time, they frequently put needle into where the area is. But the problem is this. This lady has a tumor in the buttock. Mm -hmm. And it is not only unwise, it is very dangerous to put needle to the tumor because yeah. you're going to spread the tumor. Mm -hmm. It's going to spread the cancer. So that's why I said, of course, you may say, well, it doesn't happen all the time. I understand that. But you don't want to happen just to that one time, right? Dr. Lowe, you, like you mentioned, it's very complex how the symptoms and the side effects and the causes are when it comes to Chinese medicine. But one thing that really stuck with me when we visited you was you showed us that chart that yep. um, represents the elements and you By have element. such a beautiful, simple way of explaining it. I would love to, um, yeah. I would love for it? you to share it with, with our viewers. Okay. You start from the, from here, this water element, the fire element, right? Water and uh, wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and fire, and earth, and this is metal. So this is the fire element, and what it says is that each element is interacted. So from water will give rise to wood, meaning tree need water to grow. That's this analogy, and from wood that burn into fire, so produce fire. And fire, after it's burned, becomes ash that becomes earth. Mm -hmm. And from earth, you find mineral in the, underground, in the ground. And from metal, you become liquefied. 
So this is a cycle that human body as well as universe operates. So one element helps the other keep going on. This is a positive element, positive pathway. However, on the other hand, there's, there's a negative controlling factor. Start this stuff on water again. Water will put out fire. You see the, the arrow inside? Yeah. It's a controlling. And fire, fire will melt metal. So fire controls metal. A metal, let's say, consider analogies are made into knife, can cut wood. Mm -hmm. And wood being a tree with a root can dig into earth, controlling earth. And then finally, earth will, will form a dam or bank to black water for controlling. So inside is a negative controlling. Outside is positive for forming, generating. Now, make, make, make second step is, I want to emphasize emotion. Okay. This kidney, water is kidney. The emotion is, see the red box, is fear. Wood is gallbladder and liver. The emotion is anger. Heart is small intestine and heart, and emotion is joy. And the earth, the organ involved is spleen and stomach. The emotion is worry. And metal is organ or the lung and large intestine. The organ and the emotion is grief. Oh, okay. So basically, back to the example I said before, grief is a lung. And as I mentioned before, two, in two cases, the grief created cancer in those two cases that I treated before, lung cancer. Kidney is a fear. And I've seen patients with the kidney uh, energy being low because of fear that created kidney cancer. And I've seen, for example, worry stomach, spleen, and pancreas. That's all we belong to worry. So oh. all this emotion with illness, which is not really documented or studied in Western medicine. Of course, what well, you can understand quite easily why Western medicine does not recognize this. Number one, because they don't recognize, because Western medicine is nothing but physical medicine. It's not holistic medicine. Mm -hmm. It don't emphasize in the physical part mm -hmm. and neglected human mind takes part in our health as well. But in Chinese medicine, we emphasize a lot about emotion. And in my practice oncology all these years, that's why it made me realize Western medicine is quite limited. It's not bad, but limited. Mm -hmm. We need to find something more to help people. Absolutely. And I think that's what has helped both Nally and I on our journeys is we found like the perfect marriage of marriage. East and West to help us, you know, do as well as we're doing today. And I guess one of the questions that popped in my head when you're explaining this is um, what I have learned, you know, is that your mind is so powerful, you know, as you were stating on this journey, I always tell people that your mind is the most important treatment or tool that you can, you know, use or tap into because of its power. So say, you know, given this knowledge and say, um, you know, as hard as it is for some people to accept that, you know, disease stems from emotion, um, say, you know, if we're giving this knowledge to people and they're aware, okay, well, maybe, you know, grief pertains to this lung issue, say, um, if you improve your emotions or you do the spiritual work to um, improve your emotions, do you think that that results in healing or better outcomes um, from your diagnosis or from one's diagnosis? Absolutely, absolutely. And we all know that uh, in Western med medical practices, especially oncology, they allow a support group and they've done study. Those people who, who participate in support group has better prognosis than those who, who don't. I mean, overall, in, in a broad picture. And of course, if there are a lot of other studies show that person who has a uh, positive out out outlook has better prognosis. Mm -hmm. And here I have to mention one thing about psychoneuroimmunology. I don't know if you or anybody ever heard that or familiar with that. Yeah. Psychoneuroimmunology. Mm -hmm. So three words, three, uh, three parts already tells us what it means. Psycho is the mind. Neuros, nerve, immunology, immunology. 
by psychoneuroimmunology. And this is the sub, uh, subspecialty uh, basically done by those basic researchers since 70s actually. And it never became popular in medical or clinical med medical practices. It's a shame. It's been studied already. Mm -hmm. What they found is that in their basic research, that emotion definitely has impact on our immune system. And that has been shown, demonstrated by their blood test in checking serum immunoglobin, AG, IgG, IgA, IgM, and so on and so forth. That has been demonstrated. And also, to be more specific, they have demonstrated those elements they call neuropeptides. So in other words, understanding the neuropeptides are secreted by stimulation, stimulating certain emotional component. For example, grief, sadness, and so on and so forth. Each one will result in increased neuropeptide. So in a sense, I like to urge everybody to think carefully. Emotion is not just a descriptive term of a person's temper. No, emotion is a real biochemical producer. Emotion can create biochemical changes, mm -hmm. biological changes in our human body. For those of you who are interested, you can go on, online, look for psy psychoneuroimmunology. There are tons of study. I mean, legit clinical studies. Those are not hearsays. And that's very important. And I always ask, advise my patients who look for alternative medicine or complementary medicine. I always advise, please be very careful. Only read those reliable, well-supported paper. Please don't listen to all the, all the geniuses in the world. <laughs> yeah. too many. It's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Now that we've identified that cancer and all illnesses are so much deeper than just you know, the physical, the body. So let's say a patient then digs deeper and then discovers, you know, what's the cause of their illness or their cancer. What would you then, how would you guide them from there? I guess, as you mentioned, the first step is discovering the problem, what, what's going on in their lives, and then what? Okay, good question. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's very simple. I put it this way. All these years of my practice in medicine, I always try to find the cause. So if you limit the cause, then the problem should be corrected, correct? Absolutely. Um, if you don't really limit the cause, just keep treating symptoms, it's not gonna help. Mm -hmm. Let me distract myself a little bit. One of the reasons why I left chemo oncology is because chemotherapy is not a complete and perfect Way, of course, it helps. But in treating patients with uh, cancer with chemotherapy, it serves as, as if that, that you try to cut the symptoms, but not really attaching, uh, attacking the cause, correct? Mm -hmm. so now that we, or let's say I, not we, I recognize that cancer is caused by emotion. So naturally, logically speaking, the cause of the emotion, once it's correct it, then cancer should go away. Because emotion causes cancer. I mean, emotional problem causes cancer. And that particular problem, once it's eliminated, then I expect body can return to normal, repairing to normal. Because we all have healing power. Most people don't realize that. You know, as a doctor oh, for the past 40 years, uh, Western medicine is great, as I said, but a lot of misunderstanding, misleading public, as if that everybody say, hey, doc, give me a pill, kill, kill me. No, you kill yourself. I cannot cure you. Mm -hmm. One example is that, for example, that people think oh, no, it, it depends on many things to help get better. No, that's not correct. On simple cases, when you have a cut, the surgeon cuts, put stitches on, and put some bandage on. You think, oh, surgeon help me heal. No, your body heals. The stitches, are put, put them together, hold them together. It is your body healed by itself. Correct? Very right. much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have to understand, we have to recognize, 
we have the capacity in healing, physically in the wound, more deeper with the organ dysfunction. Absolutely. That's so beautifully said and so important is that, you know, our body, I believe we all have an inner physician and our body has this knowing this, like it knows being in perfect health is its natural state. In addition to acupuncture, do you recommend any other healing modules, for example, like yoga or meditation or Tai Chi or any other things that you would recommend that could help someone get to the root cause of their disease? Very good question. And I, <clears throat> I give advice about this aspect all the time when, when people come to me. Of course, meditation is number one I would recommend mm -hmm. because I recognize, I, I practice myself too. Yes. Because the right, meditation, when you get, reach the meditative state of mind, and that's the level you can elevate yourself to that level so the healing can take place. And of course, a lot of people say, oh, it's not easy to meditate. Oh, I admit that it's not easy. It's simple, but not easy. What's it's your way of meditating, Dr. Lo? Oh, yeah, <laughs> everybody has different ways. Some people said they have to have picture of the sand and sun on the bees. Some people say I have to stick to the uh, music and whatnot, or some chanting technique and so on and so forth. It does not matter. And whatever technique you feel comfortable. And the key result is that you're going to lead yourself into a meditative state of mind. Those methods are just vehicle to take you there. So mm -hmm. when you reach the meditative state of mind, then you're going to enhance your body of its healing power. In our physical body, human body, Chinese, non-Chinese, doesn't matter the same. When we think, when we're thinking, we are moving our energy. So in other words, our body doesn't get to rest. But when you start thinking, mm -hmm. then body is harmonious state, neutral. And that's how the, the immune system will be enhanced. That's my personal belief. Back to uh, Stephanie's question, what other things are yes. meant? Meditation number one, yoga is important, but one thing, you see, I, don't, I do not practice yoga. I know yoga involves a lot of body movement and so on and so forth. But I believe yoga has, a, has its value and has its similar uh, mental discipline as that of Chinese Qigong as well. Yeah. What I'm saying is that I believe yoga should also emphasize mind-body connection Yes. Instead of just body twisting technique. Yes. All right. So that's why I advise. And also one thing I would advise people to be careful in doing yoga is that don't hurt yourself. Because I've seen a lot of patients come to me injured by yoga. <laughs> because the person does the thing that, that the body doesn't allow. <laughs> so be very careful with that. All right. Sure. And there are many other by mind body practices, of course, where I can choose to do it. But just be very careful. Don't hurt yourself because uh, sometimes people can get carried away do things that is not really suitable for that person's physical body. So be, be careful with that. So back to acupuncture, um, just again, you know, because this may be totally new to somebody who's mm -hmm. never even tried acupuncture. Um, how often, I know when I leave your practice, sometimes I, I drive actually from New Rochelle to Hackensack, which is pretty far, but I always, when I leave your office, I always wish that you were closer so I could see you more often. Um, but in order for somebody to receive the benefits from acupuncture, like what would you recommend? How often should you visit your acupuncturist? Well, in general, for those who are receiving chemotherapy or immunotherapy or radiation therapy, I think once a week is optimum. Mm -hmm. for, for, for those who in general public or those without any active treatment, you know, once every other week, once every third week would be enough to maintain good health. As I said, what I do for maintaining good health is I balance the whole, whole channel and with emphasis of boosting immune system. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. So once every week for those who are under the treatment and once every two or three weeks or even once a month for health maintenance. What's your take on Chinese herbs? Both Stephanie and I have been taking Chinese herbs for years now. Do you recommend Chinese herbs along with acupuncture okay, and Chinese everything herb, else you mentioned? Very good. Chinese herbs is an important uh, component in helping uh, everybody in general. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, up to now, in my personal research, there's not one Chinese herb can kill cancer cell. It does not exist. Mm-hmm. What Chinese herb basically does is strengthen you. And it comes to a basic principle in Chinese medicine, which is quite different from Western medicine. What I'm trying to explain is that in Western medicine, they aim to kill abnormal cells or abnormal components. For example, you have bacterial infection, you have antibiotics. Mm-hmm. You have fungal infection, you have antifungal. You have a parasites, antiparasites, right? Right. You have cancer cell, you use anti that kill cancer. So those are just aimed to kill. Some are successful, some are not. However, there's not one medicine in Western medicine that can support you to bring you up your own mm-hmm. system. Correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a big difference. In China medicine, when it comes to the, one of the aspects of disease or illnesses, is China medicine emphasizes two directions. One, boost one's integrity, one's uh, righteous qi, meaning boost your system. Mm-hmm. Number two, eradicate, eliminate the invading organisms, the evil qi. So the two directions are there. And comes to the first one, how do you boost your own system? As you said, acupuncture and herb. So that's a value of Chinese herb, boosting you. They're yes. not killing anything. They yes. boost you. So is acupuncture, boost you. And many times people tell, oh, can acupuncture kill cancer cell? No, I'm sorry, the honest truth. It does not kill cancer cell. But it can help you, strengthen you, and you go fight. And that's the Chinese medicine. That's, that part is so different from Western medicine. Of course, not to say Chinese medicine does not have agents or herbs that can use to kill other things. For example, in parasites, interesting. You know that, you know that thing? Um, Pomegranate? Yes. yes. Chinese use the skin, the husk of that fruit to kill parasites. Wow. Kill parasites. Wow. So it's powerful. So Chinese, yeah, Chinese herb had different things that can kill microorganisms. But up to now, there's not one Chinese herb can kill cancer, just for information. But it's important to maintain good health, yes. But I would advise um, people in general, Please don't take it in your own hands. Yes. Mm, yeah. These herbs are very, can be very powerful. If you don't know how to use it, it may cause yourself trouble. Please don't do that. Yeah, that's great advice. I think with yeah. anything, it's to always consult and, and know, do your research before hiring anybody and just make sure that you know, you know, that you're working with someone credible and what you're doing, which I was going to actually um, ask if, anyone is interested in seeing you and they live like in New Jersey or New York, um, are you taking new patients at your well, practice? Well, this crisis is over. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy to help anybody because you see, one of the, the mission I give to myself is that I left medical oncology, I stopped chemotherapy and all those things because there are millions of them doctors out there, they don't need me. But the, yeah. the thing I practice, not too many people know how to do it. So I rather, mm-hmm do what I do now to help prevent or to help prevent the recurrence, recurrence of cancer or just prevent cancer from developing to begin with. So I'm very happy in doing this. So in my everyday practice, so those regal patients come here for menstrual problems so on and so forth or any stomach, lung problem, I always tell them, please stay healthy, please be healthy and yeah. be be happy and be healthy. I have to ask though, because you say be happy, be healthy. And this is a question we ask all practitioners is what's your take on diet? Okay, diet is very important. Actually, it's one of the important parts in Chinese medicine in terms of disease illness formation. Mm-hmm. Okay, in Chinese medicine, actually, they talk about seven f- factors that can affect the illness formation. And number one is from outer environment, the many seasonal related, let's say viral infection, flu, or let's say what we're dealing with now, that's from seasonal viral infection. Number two is emotional imbalance that cause illness. Number three is diet. Mm-hmm. Number four is overdoing 
physical activity. Number five it is irregular daily activities. Number six is injury, external injury by accidents and whatnot. And number seven is inheritor, uh, inher inherited. So back to your question, diet, which is very important, yes, very important. Uh, actually, Chinese medicine has recognized the importance of diet about 2,000 years ago, because in the, in the book of China, Chinese medical classics that's compiled 2,000 years ago, it had mentioned that when one indulges too much sweets, greasy food, one may develop symptoms that is what we call diabetes. They documented that 2,000 years ago. Yeah. So in general, Chinese medicine, Chinese medicine recommended that one stay healthy with less greasy, less pungent, less uh, uh, sweet food, and emphasizes in the balance of the diet. So in, in modern language, I can say more vegetable, less meat. Perfect. Yay, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. It's, simple. it's very simple. More vegetables, simple. less meat. And yes. as a doctor, of course, I mean, or oh, sometimes uh, I have to refer a patient to a nutritionist, dietitian, and so on and so forth. They go through cal fine calculation of how much calorie this one, how much calorie that one. It's nothing wrong with that. But do you think it's applicable for everybody, everyday life to, to measure everything? No, no. So impractical. Impractical. Yeah. Ideally, it's okay, but it's not practical. So usually, I advise, advise people is that please just use common sense. More yeah. vegetable, less meat. Let's say seventy percent vegetables, thirty percent meat. In my opinion, but of course, the protein ratio may be different during when the person is younger, when they need protein to grow. For example, young kids, adolescent. But after a certain age, the ratio had to be changed. And mm -hmm. after, let's say, 30s, uh, in my opinion, from a medical standpoint, after the 30s or 40s, the diet should be 70% uh, vegetable and 30% animal products. And it's the like ratio may be even more as time goes on. Wow. And the quantity is important. And as I said, it is impractical for a person to anybody to measure whatever you put in your mouth. You cannot yeah. weigh everything. So just yeah. common sense. And very important concept, China medicine also advises do not eat 100% eat full, 70% you should stop. Oh, like mm. the overeating, like yes. like a And also it says, don't eat late at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and eat small frequent diet, which is very healthy. That thousand years ago, they advised that already. And now you use that, in that advice, it fits perfectly for a person with reflux. Mm -hmm. You know what's come up, come up through the problem of uh, cause of reflux? Overeating in this society. Sometimes people ask me, oh, do you have any special diet for cancer? I'm sorry, it does not exist. Okay, please, please, my honest opinion. There's no diet that can kill cancer. I'm sorry, it's not that. You just have to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And the most important is that if you stay healthy, your body starts to regenerate, start to heal, and that's what you want. Yeah. There's no magic bullet. I'm sorry, there's none. Mm -hmm. The magic bullet, yes, I'm sorry, there's one, yourself. Yeah. Yes, I yes. love that. Putting all of these tools together, you know, to find what's ultimately going to give our bodies a chance to heal. I had a patient that's in, in early 90s, breast cancer. Early stage, I guess. I don't remember exactly too long ago. And she has met, uh, mastectomy at that time and uh, maybe six, course, six courses of chemotherapy, which is CMX, uh, cytoxamethotrexate, if I have you, and that time they used that, we used that. But anyway, she did well, and two years later, the tumor came back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my God, I don't like to see a recurrent tumor. That is a tough one, it's tough. Anyway, I got chemotherapy, and she went through. And she's alive and well, till today. So that was about five years after that, then I had the nerve to ask her. <laughs> I said, what happened to your life then? Tell me that. Tell me the truth. Because at that time, I already knew some, something had, 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 had to happen. And she said to me, well, the first time when I get cancer, she said, at that time, I was pregnant. And she was in her 40s. At that time, she had a son about 10 years old already. 
and she got pregnant by a boyfriend then. So she said, I thought that was a gift from God, so I decided to keep it. But my boyfriend just didn't agree and whatnot. And she terminated it mm -hmm. and she split with the boyfriend. So that was what happened because the first cancer. And second time, this is her own words. She said, I was stupid enough to pick him back. And she said, I knew he gave me cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, <laughs> that, I dumped him. So I'm okay. <laughs> so that's the cure. <laughs> so that is the proof that, in a sense, it's not a matter of dumping anybody. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that she eliminated the cause yes. of her emotional problem. That's why I always tell people, if it's possible, you just have to work hard enough to identify the problem and truly let go. Let go mm -hmm. means to say el eliminate, yeah. eradicate the cause. What if you can't find the cause? What if someone's like trying to find the cause, but just, I don't know. Like what, how, what, do you, what advice do you give someone to find the cause? Yes, I know. I hear that all the time. <clears throat> Someone, sometimes it's hard to find a cause. I understand that. But uh, I would say it is because the person made it, made it. person using the denial mechanism. Mm. Don't want to admit that's the cause for different reasons. That's my interpretation. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one example to support that. I see, I hear that every now and then. It's not cancer. Just to give you some idea about human psychology in everyday life. Yeah. Um, that was almost 20 years ago. I had a patient, a school teacher. She came to me for stomach discomfort, indigestion, this and that. After I discussed with her, listened to her story, then I asked her, what bothers you in your life? Because I knew as emotional issue emotionally causing her stomach problem based on five element theory. Remember I said, worry, worry, mm -hmm. what's thinking cause stomach problem. So I recognize that's a, that's a cause. He said, no, no, I'm very happy. She's a school teacher. I'm divorced 20 years ago. I'm over with it. I have no problem. I'm very happy. I'm very happy being alone, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, well, fine. I said, I still think that's emotional problem that causes a stomach problem. Well, a few times then she stopped coming, she got better and on and off, back and forth, and it was fine, she stopped coming. But two years after that, she called me, she said, Dr. Lo, I gotta see you again. I said, okay, why? So she came, she told me, Dr. Lo, you're right. You're right. It's something bothering me. She said, what? So she described the source this. She said, she's a, she's a school teacher, 50 some years old. She said, I had a girlfriend who was, of course, a school teacher. And every time I would go on my way to do things with her and for her. And until one day, I, for something, I didn't call her, I didn't let her know. And that friend was very angry and called me up. She said, call me up and started telling me that how dare I didn't call her to let her know about certain things. And that really made her realize that all those years, she went out her way. She, she said her own words is that, I thought I was just being a nice person. I do the best for my, my friends, but I had enough, I stopped. And I cut off my list, my stomach better, the problem got better. Mm -hmm. So the, the important le lecture and uh, lesson from this example is that many times, we do things that we mentally think it is right thing to do. However, emotionally, we don't like it. Mm -hmm. What I, the way I put it is that our brain said, I should do this to be a nice person. But my heart said, no, I don't like it. However, the brain prevails. So I continue to do that, thinking I'm doing the right thing, ignoring my heart. Does it make some sense? So much sense. Yeah. 
It's like really so good. resonates, like always Same. doing things that you feel bad if you don't do it or saying yes when you really want to say no or yeah. feeling like you're obligated. Mm-hmm. They build up. And I have one analogy for you and everybody else to keep this mechanism, this phenomenon in one analogy, which is you have, you have pebble in your shoe. That wouldn't kill you. Fire would annoy you to death. <laughs> yeah. That's true. And actually, it's more, much more severe than a pebble because it causes you more than just pain in the foot. It affects your whole system. So true. back to Nelly's uh, question, if one cannot find it, maybe some, we just try to justify our doing something that we're not really happy in doing and we swept under the rug say okay mm-hmm. it is not it's not a problem i suppose to do that no it is a problem correct absolutely. absolutely and that's why steph and i always advocate about doing the work so really digging deep and uncovering the layers and focusing on what you can do because in this world of oncology, you know, sometimes you feel like you're so disempowered and there's not much you can do for yourself aside from listen to um, the guidelines by your oncologist. But what we're here to advocate is the importance of, you know, doing the work. And when we say work is understanding what your emotions, where are they coming from? Why are you reacting the way you react beyond the cancer? Right. And, and, That's why we try to provide tools to meditate and to um, find joy, really, essentially, is what we we always say is the most important thing to do when someone approaches us with, what's your best advice, you know, to to fight cancer? And we, we, we always just give the advice of finding joy and finding peace. Exactly. I have one thing to mention, to comment on this, fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I even advise people. Please don't fight cancer. Exactly. You don't fight. You just strengthen yourself. Yes. Harmonize your <laughs> yes. body. Yes. Then this, this, that will be dismissed. You don't fight. Yes. Cancer is, you know, strictly speaking, cancer is part of the body formation physically, correct? Mm-hmm. So it's not an invading enemy. It's some, it's, it's body goes wrong in producing abnormal cell. That's all it is. Yep. But it's mm-hmm. not really enemy in that sense. So please don't fight. Because when you think of fight, you, you have negative in- input already. So true. I you love that you said that. Happy, yes. harmonious, balanced, the joy. And that's the key issue. Right. One thing, one thing more about, I like to tell stories. If you <laughs> we love your stories. Okay. It is a story I know for good. I was almost 20 years ago. Um, I was still doing hematology oncology. And there was a lady, 60 some years old, Hispanic, in uh, myeloma. 60 some year old Hispanic lady, myeloma, multiple myeloma, which is a you know, bone marrow problem. But her condition was very early, so I just needed to monitor her once a month to check the blood count and so on and so forth. Every time she came with the son because of the language barrier. The son was born in early 30s. Nice, young man, six foot, 200 pounds, healthy, and she, he would translate for me. So one time they came in. So as usual, I'll say, hello, how are you? And his name, they say, Jose. I said, Jose, how are you doing? He said, Doc, well, not good. I said, what's the matter? He said, I have stomach problem. Bother me. I said, why? He said, I, I don't know. It bothers me a lot. I went to see a doctor. And by the way, heard his doctor. I said, which doctor did you go? He said, Dr. So and so. I said, Oh, I know, he's my friend. He said, My doctor gave me medication, the stomach, didn't get better. So I went back and he sent me for his endoscopy, checked the scope, his stomach is okay. So, but it still bothered me. He said, My doctor said, It doesn't get any better. I need a CAT scan to see what's going on. So I knew what the problem is right away. Because, you know, my experience in, in medicine for so many years, that tells me, this young man cannot have any cancer. This young man can have never had any illnesses. Are you kidding? Last time I saw him, he's okay, and all of a sudden, stomach problem. And the stomach, of course, upper GI endoscopy cause, uh, proves that there's nothing wrong in the stomach. So it is not an organic, it's not an organ problem. By the way, my decision was directed into emotional. So my question was, 
So what happened to you recently? What happened to your life? And very interesting. Listen to this. Say, you know, Doc, I'm getting a divorce. He's 33 years old. I said, divorce? What happened? He said, I lived with my uh, girlfriend for seven years, and we, we get married for six months, and we'll get divorced. Wow. Said, wow. <laughs> That's odd, right? <laughs> seven years, live together, and six, six months, uh, marriage won't get divorced. But I, I, I mean, no judging, making any judgment over personal life. So I came right to the core of the problem. I said, so, Jose, what's the argument here? Of course, understanding divorce, there's no happy divorce. Always argument, the fights, correct? Yes. So I asked him, so what's the argument? Wow, start bed the, the woman, so on and so forth. And she, uh, she said, oh, she wants money and so on and so forth, right? So I asked him, I said, listen, how much money you make? He said, oh, good money. I said, how much money in the bank? He said, $30,000. I said, okay, can you make it back? He said, yes. I said, listen, give her the money. You save your life. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I explained to him, I said, listen, if you don't, you know what's going to happen? Put that $30,000, you're going to drag on, the lawyer will take away the money, number one. Number two, your stomach is going to get worse. Six months later, you're going to have another CAT scan, nothing. And it still bother you. Another six months later, you're going to have CAT scan. And maybe one or two years, it can drag on. You're going to have real stomach problem by then, and you, have no, you don't have that $30,000. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I said, give her the money. Just let go. Let yes. go. Yes. And then the father, he listened to me, and then father, the following visit, he came. I said, Jose, how's your stomach? They're better now. I said, what? You gave her money? They yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting because that, that his divorced wife should thank me of the money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of like the same underlying theme with every story, whether it's cancer, not cancer. It's kind of like the same. Emotion. Yeah. So emotion. that's why the more I practice, the more I realize that I am going to do what I'm doing here to help people stay away from serious illnesses, either cancer or non-cancer. Just be happy. Yes. Happy. Don't fight. I guess I'd love for you, you to maybe end this interview with just your final tips for anyone coming to you. I'm going to say with a cancer diagnosis, just because I know a lot of women who listen to our podcast do have cancer. And I feel like cancer is just an analogy to every other disease and illness. Mm -hmm. But um, someone comes to you, what would you tell them to do? And let's say they can't come to you directly. And those who can will definitely give all of your information. And we're going to link your website. And we're yes. going to provide your contact information so that they can book an appointment. But for our listeners listening all around the world, what's something that they can do for themselves today? Okay. All right. My advice is always this. I combine East and West. I do not exclude Western medicine. No, do not. It's unwise to do that. Because we know very well hormone therapy is valuable and many other treatments. Yes. So one cannot exclude that. However, one has to just be careful enough to be aware of the side effects and complications and seek help with their oncologist, number one. So do not abandon Western medicine when it's suggested appropriately, all right? That's number one. Number two, my emphasis will be, you are your own healer. Please do not forget that. The key to healing is in your hands. Please, please believe in that. You can heal, all right? With all the practices and whatnot. And we have talked about how to find the cause. When you eliminate the cause, then you start enhancing your healing process and so on and so forth, all right? And number three, as I say always, in the end, I always tell everybody, be happy. Now, of course, people say, well, it's easier said than done. No, it is not so. It is, can be done quite easily as well. You have to set your mind. Mm -hmm. You have to set your mind. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. I think like your thoughts and beliefs and knowledge are so in alignment with what 
the walk that we're both walking right now is both merging, you know, East and West and finding our personal perfect marriage to help us overcome the statistics and the odds. And thank God um, it's worked thus far. And we're so honored to have had you today to share your professional knowledge with our community. I mean, it's, it's so valuable and you're such a special person. So we're, we're so grateful to have had you on our podcast today. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share with everybody my view is about healing. It is not medicine, it's a healing itself. It's more than medicine. All right? Yes. Hope everybody stay well during this crisis and soon I'll be back to work and you too can go out. Yes, can't wait to come see you. And like Nally said, we're gonna link your information so anyone interested in finding you will be able to do so easily. And um, if anyone listening or watching this episode um, knows somebody who could benefit from traditional Chinese medicine or has questions about it or acupuncture, please share this episode with them. Um, in addition to watching today, we're available on all major podcast platforms. And um, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at www.thethriversguide.com to get all of our Thriver Talk updates. And always remember, where there's a Thriver's will, there's a Thriver's way. Thank you, Dr. Lo. Thank, Thank you, you for Dr. making Lowe. us happy, very yes. happy today. <laughs> Thank you. Be face. happy. Right. So true. Okay. Yes. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, Bye. Dr. Lo. Bye-bye. Okay,